right, looks like everybody's here. So we'll call the select board meeting to order for Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021. And in attendance is Joyce Chungalo, David Phil, uh, Jane Nevinsmith, Amy Parsons, and John Waskevitz. And all votes will be taken via roll call. And this meeting is being recorded. Um, so we'll go, we have a uh, posted FY22 tax classification hearing at 6 p.m. So we'll start off right with that. And then we'll do the usual consent agenda and whatnot uh, after that hearing is closed. So we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And uh, Dan, do you want to start off? Uh, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. OK. Uh, this one, share slideshow from the beginning. And Dan, let me just say before you start your presentation, uh, this is a public hearing, but please uh, don't interrupt the select board or the assessor as uh, we go through the process. We'll give everybody plenty of time for public questions and comments and whatnot. So just uh, Jennifer is going to be on the mute button just to kind of keep it in order. Uh, but go ahead, Dan. Okay. Uh, before we start, a few facts about fiscal 2022. The tax levy limit for 2022 is $13,545,801. Our fiscal 22 tax levy, which is the amount that we're actually raising, is $13,252,046. The total residential value for 2021 was $698,502,000. For 22, the residential value is $730,730,500. The residential levy share for 21 was 8,714,192. The, the levy share is the amount, that is the amount that the residential properties paid of our tax levy for last year. If we adopt a single rate this year for 22, the residential levy share is going to go up to 9,187,259. That's roughly $470,000 more. For fiscal 21, our commercial and industrial commercial, industrial and personal property value was $352,168,540. The total for FY22 for CINP is $323,302,989. It's roughly a $29 million decrease. The levy share for last year for CINP was $4,393,503. And our levy share this year with a single rate is 4064787 So there's roughly $330,000 that's gone down for this year. The average home last year, single family home was assessed for 350200 The average single family home for 22 is going to be 366800 The 2021 average tax bill was 4202 this year with a single rate, the average bill will be $4,610. If a single rate is adopted, the tax rate will be $12.57 for all classes of property. And just a note, splitting the rate will not increase tax revenue for the town of Hadley. And we're gonna, I'm gonna briefly go over the assessor's recommendations at this point. This year, as in the past, the assessors are recommending no open space discount, no residential exemption, and no small commercial exemption. The assessors are recommending a split rate for 2022, and the following slides will show the reasons why. Each year, the select board must vote how to allocate the tax levy in Hadley between all classes of property. There's four options that you have to do this. Selection of a residential factor, which is whether to have a single rate or a split rate, whether or not to grant an open space discount, grant a residential exemption, or grant a small commercial exemption. And before we get into that, I just want to do a brief history of, of the split tax rate in Massachusetts. The split tax rate originated after the passage of two and a half in 1980. Prop two and a half required that all assessments be at full and fair market value. Prior to 1982, many communities engaged in disproportionate assessment policies. Commercial and industrial properties were assessed at their full market value, while residential properties were assessed at a fraction of their full value. When two and a half was enacted, the residential tax burden in large communities skyrocketed, while commercial tax burden decreased. 
This caused politicians to worry about getting reelected. So special legislation was passed to allow communities to legally tax commercial properties at a higher rate than what their single tax rate bill would be. This sheet gives a quick summary of our fiscal 22 levy limit. It's got our 21 levy limit of 12 million 77,192. We've added our two and a half percent, which is 301,930. We've added our new growth of 136,101, which came in about 30% higher than we estimated in the spring for a levy subtotal of 12,515,223. To that number, we've added in the debt exclusions of 866,585 and the water sewer exclusions that have been added in of 163,993. And that's the, the half of the payment for the Callahan well, the Callahan treatment plant. So our levy limit for this year is 13,545,801. Our levy ceiling, which is the amount we could raise, the maximum amount we could raise if our tax rate was $25 is 26,350,837. But that number doesn't have any bearing until values would have to plummet for that limit to come into effect. This sheet shows our values based on state use code and the parcel count. The residential value for this year, as I said before, is 730 million, 730, 500, which is up about $33 million. Commercial is down to, to 267.45, industrial is down slightly to 221.1793, and our personal property is at 40,377,000. Our total value is 1 million, 1 billion, 54,033,489. So we're only up about a million dollars net over last year for our values. The minimum residential factor. The minimum residential factor is the lowest percentage of, tax, of the tax levy that can be borne by the residential and open space classes. For FY22, Hadley's MRF is 77.8781%. And that would be the if you were to shift it 150% that's what the residential would bear 77% of what they would normally have. A single rate would be 100%. And you may adopt a factor between 1.0 and 0 0.77871. A residential factor of 1.0 will have a single rate of 1257 for all properties. And if you increase or decrease the adopted residential factor of 77.8781%, residential taxes would drop by 22.1% and commercial properties would go up by 50% with a few exceptions that we'll cover in a few slides. This chart shows for the last several years, the residential and open space percentage versus the commercial and industrial and personal property percentages. You can see from the two highlighted years for 22, residential is 69.3, Last year was 66.4. Commercial and industrial is going from 33.5 last year to 30.67. So there's been about a 3% shift in value over the last year. This slide gives average tax bills for 2021. Our number hasn't changed from last from fiscal 20. It's still 4202. We are towards the bottom end of the scale. The only ones that are below us are a few of the communities that have a split rate. And if they had a single rate, the only one that would be below us is Springfield. And their assessed value is less than half of what our value is. Uh, this is a, a big slide to highlight. It's fiscal 20 to fiscal 22 average tax bill change. The top half is residential. For fiscal 20, the average value was 328.8, with the average tax bill being 42.02. Last year, the values went to 350, 200, and we kept the average bill at 4202. This year, the values are up to 366.8, and the average bill, when you round it, would be 4611. That's a 9.7 percent increase over last year. Commercial for 20, the average value was 765.1, with the average bill being 9,778. In 21, the value crept up a little bit because of some commercial development but the average went to 765.9. The average bill actually dropped almost $600 to 9,191. And that was a 6% drop because we didn't adjust commercial values, but the rate dropped from 1278 to 
This year, the average value was down from 765 to 6868. The average bill will drop to 8,633, which is another 6% drop in commercial. And the overall change from fiscal 20 is down 11.7% for commercial, while residential will be up 9.7. This chart gives the properties that are in our written report. The top five are commercial properties. The bottom five are residential properties. All of the commercial values on here dropped from last year. All the residential values, well, the first four went up. Property J on the bottom, uh, their value did not change because the sales did not indicate that that style of home needed to be adjusted. It shows what their fiscal 21 tax is and what the 22 single tax is. And if you were to adopt a single a split rate of 7%, 10%, or 12%. And I just want to highlight the 7% the column. For property A, last year they paid 59.88. This year with a single rate, they'll pay 59.69. And with a 7% shift, they would pay 63.87. That's an increase of 418 from the single rate and an increase of 399 from fiscal 21. Property B is 59.12. Last year, 55.73 this year with a single rate and if you shift it 7%, they're gonna go up to 59.63. That's a $390 increase from a single rate this year, but only a $51 increase from last year in the actual change in the, the amount of the bill. Property C is 10,036 last year, it's 99.88 this year. With a single rate, with a 7% shift, it's 10,488. It's a $500 increase from the single rate this year and 452 from last year. Property D, they paid 12,535 last year, 11,817 this year. With a split rate, they'll go up to 12,644, which is an increase of 827 from this year's single rate, but only an increase of 109 from last year. And the last property E, they paid 92.99 last year. They'll pay 8,700 this year with a single rate and 93.10 with a 7% shift. It's an increase from the shift of 610 from a single rate this year, but only $81 from last year's bill. The residential, Property F went from 37, we'll go from 37.46 to 41.49 with a single rate. A 7% shift is 4,020, which is a $129 decrease from the single rate, but a $274 increase from fiscal 21. Property G, 52.52, last year, 55.74 with a single rate this year, 5401 with a split rate. It's down 173 from this year's single rate, but up 149 from the prior year. Property H, they paid 3565 last year, $4,003 this year with a single rate and 3879 if you shifted 7%, which is $124 decrease from the single rate this year, but an increase of $314 from last year. Property I, they paid $41.54 last year. With a single rate this year, they'll pay $43.91. And as, if you shift 7%, they'll do $42.55, which is a $136 decrease from the single rate and 101 from the increase from last year. And the last one where the value didn't change, it's not gonna be as drastic, they paid $42.25 last year, $44.25 this year. With a split rate, they'll go to $42.88. That's a $137 decrease from the split rate and a $63 increase from last year. So even if, if you shift the rate, the, do a 7% shift to commercial, industrial, and personal, everybody is still going to go up. And the large amounts that are on here, they're, they're still in the 3 and 4% range for most of them. The commercial property C, that is going up 452 has a tax bill of almost 10,000. So it's about a 4% increase from fiscal 21. These following slides show what a CIP shift of seven, 10 or 
will impact property classes as a whole. For 7% first, for fiscal 19, the residential taxes were 7,936,888. For fiscal 20, the levy share went up by 5.5% to 8,377,000. For 21, it went up by 0.05% to 8,382,000. This year, it's going to jump up to 9,185, which is an increase of 9.58%. With a split of 7%, the levy will jump up only 6.18%. And if you look at this number right here, from 20 to 22, it would be a change of six, increase of 6.24% over the three years. For commercial, the levy went from just under 4.2 million in 19 to 4.44 million in 20 to 4.22 in 21, and this year it's down to 4,063,000, which represents the bottom figure here is an 8.5% decrease in commercial taxes from 20 to 22. If you were to split it by 7% or raise it by 7%, the levy share would go to 4,348,425. And the overall change from 20 to 22 would be, it would still be down 2.11%. For the 10% shift, the first four columns in both residential and commercial are the same. With a 10% shift, the residential percentage change would be 4.78% with a 4.85% increase over the three years. And commercial, it would be a 5.8% increase over last year and a 0.65% increase over the two years. For the 12% shift, residential, if you were to shift commercial 12%, residential would go up 3.829% this year from last year and 3.886% based on two years ago, what they paid. Commercial would go up 7.71 this year and overall 2.4 based on last year. The next two slides, a, a big topic when we've had these hearings has been farmers. And the next two slides have four farms on them each, and I've omitted the names, so it's not to get people upset. Uh, but it lists what they have for residential and commercial properties, what they pay with a single rate for this year, and what they would pay with a 7, 10, or 12% shift. Farm A has three residential parcels and 16 commercial parcels. They will pay $22,239 in taxes this year with a single rate. If you were to shift it 7%, the tax bill would go up $155. But there is a, a point with Farm A, there are non-traditional commercial buildings on Farm A that have caused that to go up higher rather than dropping. Farm B, has two residential and 10 commercial parcels. They would pay 22,604 with a single rate and with a 7% shift, $23,012. Farm B has two commercial parcels that are leased out to a regional or I, I would say a regional tenant that the tax bill for those two land parcels is passed on to that tenant. So we're showing a $408 increase the increase for those two parcels alone is about $800. So what would happen with farm B is on what that farmer will, would pay would actually drop about $400 with a 7% and the, the number would go up or it would drop even further with the 10 or 12% shift. Farm C is what I would consider a more traditional farm. They have two residential parcels and two commercial parcels. This year with a single rate, they're going to pay 11187 With a 7% shift, they'll pay $11,010, which is a decrease of 177 Farm D is another parcel that has non-traditional commercial on it, but they also own a great number of residential parcels. So their, their bill would be 33985 with a single rate, and with a 7% shift, it drops to 33549 
So they're going down $436. This slide has, uh, for Farm E, there's one residential parcel and five commercial parcels that they own. Their tax bill would be 6117. 6117 for a single rate, 6085 for a split rate. So they would actually drop 32 when you take into account the reduction for the house and the increase for the commercial. Farm F, one residential and 19 commercial. Their bill with a single rate would be 6,865. That would drop to 6,837 if you were to shift it 7%. So it would, they would still see a drop of $28 with a split rate from the single rate for 22. Farm G has two residential and six commercial. Their bill is 11,784. With a split rate of 7%, they're gonna to drop to $11,562. So it goes down $223. And Farm H, it's two residential, four commercial, but there is a, this farm parcel also has a non-traditional farming commercial building on it. They would pay 12,625 with a single rate and 12,665 with a 7% shift. So it only goes up about $40 if you were to split it on that one. This chart indicates it, with the CIP at 100 and residential at 100, our tax rate would be 1257. And it's got the increments in 5% shifts from the 100% to the 150%, what the residential factor would be and what the tax rates would be. We, the report that we handed out that's attached in board docs has this broken out in 1% increments, but it wouldn't, translate well on screen to have 150 lines here. There's also an additional option if a split rate is adopted where the select board can vote to shift chapter land into open space, which redu reduce the tax burden on these parcels. Any farm parcel that is not in chapter would still be subject to the CINP rate. And this is a slide that we've used in the past. I've updated it for 22, shows a parcel that is non-chapter of two and a half acres that's farmed and a chapter land parcel that's five acres that's farmed. And you can see the, the non-chapter parcel would, if you adopt a 10% shift would go up by about $160 this year. Uh, the chapter parcels would go from $69 to $76 a year. So it's gonna be a $7 increase. Typically you're looking at 50 cents to 75 cent increase per acre for chapter land. So anybody that's farming that's in chapter, the reduction in their home taxes would more than offset the increase in the land value the, in the, the farmland taxes. The other options that we have is the open space discount where you can grant up to 25% off to all parcels classified as open space. About 15 years ago, our DOR rep said that we should shift all open space class property into the actual other class that it should be either residential, commercial, or industrial based on the zoning and, and the use. We have not really had open space since probably the mid 2000s. So the only time this would factor in is if you adopted a split rate and decided to shift chapter land into open space. The residential exemption, uh, the select board has the option of granting a residential exemption of up to 35% to all owner occupied residential properties in Hadley. The 35% reduction amounts to about $117,300 off of each owner occupied home in town. The tax rate though, would change from 1257 to 1684 because the, the amount of the tax levy paid by the residential cannot change because the residential exemption is granted. So what that does is it, it means that houses that are assessed for 462,200 would pay more with the residential exemption than they would if we had a single tax rate. This is typically adopted in communities that have high-end resort communities Nantucket was one that, that was brought up. Uh, their average residential value is 2.5 million. 
And I'm sure there's a number of high-end residential homes out there that are well over 10 or 12 million. Their tax rate though, at 2.5 million for the average parcel is only $3.63. So their average bill is comparable to what Amherst pays, probably around nine grand a year. Uh, this just repeats what I said. If you were to shift it or grant the exe full exemption, anything assessed at 462.2 or higher would pay more in taxes if there wasn't a residential exemption. The small commercial exemption. This is an exemption that you can grant up to 10% of the commercial parcels commercial value can be exempted from the tax calculation. It has to meet two criteria, have an assessed value under $1 million and less than 10 annualized employees. We went through the list this year and last year we had 41 parcels that would qualify for this. This year, because of the reduction in assessments, we have 61 parcels that would qualify. And much like the residential exemption, anything that was granted as an exemption to those 61 parcels would have to be made up by everybody else in the commercial class. So the tax rate would go from 1257 to 1267. The pros of splitting, a tax, of splitting the tax rate. Splitting the rate will stabilize tax payments for fiscal 2022 or from fiscal 2021 2022 and 2023 for both residential and commercial properties. You won't see a large spike where this year commercial prop or residential are going to go up 410 and then next year see $150 decrease in the tax rate or in their, their tax bills. And commercial won't drop. I mean, the ones that were impacted the most will see a significant drop this year, but then next year it appears that the values are coming back pretty well. Uh, to see the prices go back up to where they were paying or the tax to go back up to what they were paying in fiscal 20 or even more. The cons of a split tax rate is increased commercial, industrial and personal taxes. And that equals increased abatement applications and increased expenses. But this year we anticipate a substantial increase in commercial abatements, regardless if the rate is split or not. It's, it's six of one half dozen of another. If the rate is split, we're still gonna see a lot of commercial. We'll still, I think we're still gonna see a lot of residential because values went up a lot. The tax bills are going up a lot. Even if you split the rate, if you don't split the rate, we're still gonna see a lot of residential and commercial taxes. The next two slides show a cost of community services study. Well, actually it's three studies that were done in the last 30 years that show that basically residential pays, for every dollar that residential taxes pay, they use about $1.15 in services. Commercial uses about 30, 30 cents and open space uses about 35 cents in services. And this is a breakdown of some of the communities in mass that were used. The most comparable one here is Deerfield to us. They were done in 92 and in 2009. And it was a 16% increase for residential and 14. And the commercial was 38 and 51. And the farmland was 29 and 33. The assessor's recommendations. Again, the board is recommending adopting a split rate for fiscal 22 to stabilize and normalize tax payments for the next two years. The board recommends no open space discount. The board recommends no residential exemption and the board recommends no small commercial exemption. And if there's any questions or comments. Uh, real quick, the finance committee didn't get a chance to, to meet before this evening. So uh, they've asked that we not vote on this tonight. Uh, Dan, if I'm correct, we have until the 17th to make a decision on this, right? Right, you've got, you've got basically a couple options tonight. Okay. If you want to, you can close the public hearing and vote on the 17th. But that would pretty much prohibit anybody else from making comments on the 17th. You can continue the public hearing till the 17th and then allow people to, to give additional comments at that point, then close it and vote, or you could close it tonight and vote. I would, we don't need to have a, any vote before the 17th. Okay, so 
I definitely want to get all the public comments uh, in tonight on this, but um, I, I would like to give finance a chance to meet and come back to us next week with a recommendation or next meeting with a recommendation as well. Just all right, I have a I have a couple of questions for Dan also. Um, since the prices of homes have gone up extraordinarily, I mean, people are selling houses left and right in Hadley here uh, for an exorbitant price. The assessor's price, is the assessor's price the same as what people are selling their houses for? Our, our assessment is based on a different time period than what you would be looking at right now. These assessments are based on calendar year 2020 sales. So I would, I would say right now we're at least 10 to 12% under market. Right now in, in 2021, we're seeing, we just had a two bedroom ranch sell last week for 500,000. We had yeah. a three bedroom ranch that was 50 years old a couple of months ago, sell for 450,000. We're two years ago, or a year ago, the house right next door to it sold for 372, and it's yeah. pretty much the same house. Now, are, are there going to be, because of the change in the way the prices have gone with houses, are we in line to do another assessment of um, the prices? What, what do they call that, Dan, where we uh, reevaluate homes, uh, where eventually, that will catch up to what the price of the house was when it sold because people are coming into town and buying houses at they're not houses aren't even staying on the market two or three days without it being gone and the prices have gone up 40 60 80 thousand dollars more than what you would anticipate um is that going to change when we do our reevaluations? And when when will the next reevaluation be done? DOR requires that we do changes every year. So for next year, for fiscal 23, any of the sales that occurred in 21 will factor mm -hmm. into that. I mean, people are going crazy with the, the prices. We have a house, the appraisal was in this earlier this week. It went on the market for 565. And it was on the market for probably two weeks and it's under deposit for 600. Yeah. So they ended up $35,000 in a week. Okay. It was so, pro so projecting Dan, um, cause I'm taking into consideration this, this split tax rate right now. So taking into consideration the change in reevaluation and what we are going to be able to tax that person next year in changing the amount of money that we will be able to get from the reevaluation, which will be an increase in course of what we have right now for the bottom line, correct? Well, it'll it'll raise the value, but our it, it doesn't count as growth. So the levy won't go up, it just redistributes how it's raised. So while the residential values are going up, surprisingly, commercial values are going up this year. We had three properties sell this year that were assessed for, we had, we had one property that, that just closed last month that was assessed for 800,000, that's gone down slightly because of the COVID impact, sold for 1.6 million. We had another mm -hmm. automotive service center that was assessed for 700,000 that sold for 1.6 million earlier in the year. And we've got another parcel that was a garage, a smaller garage that we had assessed for around 250 that sold for 500. So we're looking at commercial values going up as much, if not more for the smaller stuff. But as of right now for 2022, we're not taxing them then at that rate. No, we're still looking at, at fiscal 20. We're looking Correct. at an average decrease of about 10%. Okay. The, more, the, the, higher, the more impacted the business was from COVID, the higher the decrease was. So okay. we've got anywhere from 5% decline a 25 percent decline okay i'm going to ask a personal question right now because i have a defunct uh, business that is not operative but it is a commercial piece of property where would that be assessed at um unfortunately for you if it's the one i'm thinking of it was a, a auto garage yep and garages didn't really they saw an actual boost during covid because people were home more and they were just driving around 
and they had their car serviced and worked on. So mm -hmm. you wouldn't see a decrease from last year, but you wouldn't really see an increase on that property. I mean, we're not we're not an active business. That's that's what I'm asking. We're not. Right. I, yeah. I want to say it, it's probably it probably went down five percent in value. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's coughing? Waskevich? <laughs> oh. Um, uh, Joyce, are you also right now for questions? I am. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Andy Morris Friedman, I saw your hand up first. If you want to go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan, for a really enlightening and interesting presentation. Um, I have three questions that I hope are quick. Um, first, do you know if there was a um, cost of community services study done for Hadley? And if there wasn't, why isn't there one? Uh, that survey was something that I stumbled across on probably 15, 20 years ago. It was done by American Farmland Trust. And it, it's a national firm, a uh, nonprofit firm. And I don't think there's one been, there has been one done for Hadley, but I wanna say we're gonna fall in line with the national standards. Be, it would be interesting to know, though, don't you think? Uh, yeah, but it, it's probably something that's not worth the, the okay. dollar. Um, okay, so my other question is, um, you said that there were three rates uh, uh, split, splitting 7%. What was it? 7%, 10%? Yep, 7%, 10%, and 12%. But and they didn't know anything from, one, from keeping a single rate up to 150%. Uh, and, and that percentage is the difference in the level of the two rates compared to each other, right? Uh, it's the increase in the commercial. So 7% shift would mean that commercial would pay 7% more than if we had a single rate. Okay. And, and you said that you, um, you were recommending the split rate. Did I catch which split rate you were recommending? The board didn't choose to recommend a single rate but provided several options. We haven't recommended splitting the rate in the 31 years or 30 prior years that I've been here. No one has, we have kept a single rate. This is unusual circumstance with COVID and the shift. And as a one-time shift to stabilize tax bills, is the, the $410 that we're looking to go up is gonna be $155 more than the highest increase we've had. And that was 255 about four years ago when we added the three buildings that added in to the taxes. Our typical increase is somewhere around 130 to 150. Okay, well, who, so then the, my process question is, who gets to decide whether we change to the split rate and what the percentage will be? That That's is- the procedure. That is the, the reason why we're having this hearing that that falls on the select board. Okay, thank you. I had I had one more question to Dan um, in regards to you were saying in your presentation about uh, rebates. Um, is this from commercial properties that you're looking at for rebates? Uh, I don't think I, I said rebate or I, I think it's abatements. Abatements. Right. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that a lot of commercial, especially the big box, aren't going to be satisfied with going down 15, 20, 25 percent in their value. And they're just going to file and say, we need more. We need a bigger reduction. OK, so are, are we finding that there has they applied for any during this COVID uh, for abatements? Um, so certainly I don't want to put businesses out of business by increasing their taxes. Um, so that's what I'm, my thought process is right now. And I, we have always thought like that because businesses have been very good to us um, with their contributions to our tax base. Um, so I'm just wondering how that's going to fit into all this. We had a few big box commercial abatements last year, but nothing really happened with them once we explained mm -hmm. that we were adjusting this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a misconception with the split rate is people are looking at it as increasing commercial taxes. We're not really looking, the board isn't recommending increasing commercial taxes 
over what they paid last year or two years ago. It's, it's trying to level things off. So instead of looking at it as an increase, it's gonna be a lesser reduction in tax for most businesses. So instead of somebody going down, the, the ones in that report, I've used them every year, which are the ones I used on, on the slide, there's businesses that are going down tens of thousands of dollars this year. That if you factor in, if you adopt a 7% shift, mm -hmm. instead of going down 15, 20, 30,000, they're only gonna go down 13,000, 18,000, 28,000. So it's not a case of where they're gonna be paying more. There, there are a few cases where some people will pay more. Okay. But most of the people saw at least a 5% reduction in their values this year on commercial. Okay. I mean, that's, that's good to put out there because not knowing why we would be penalizing, I would say, I mean, we have people moving to Hadley because of our low tax rate um, where, you know, we have people that have lived here in town. It's not that I don't want people to move to town, don't get me wrong, but the majority of people are moving to town because of our tax rate, which is, you know, one of the lowest in the community. So those are the things that I, I'm looking at right now to rationalize my decision. Yeah, our, our average bill of 4,200 is fairly low. I think we're ranked somewhere around 250th out of 350 communities. If mm -hmm. we were to plug a $4,600 tax bill in there, we're still going to be ranked probably around 225 in mm -hmm. the last year. And that, that number we would probably drop again, when you're looking at fiscal 22, because everybody else is gonna go up this year. Right, I mean, I'm not looking for us to be the lowest tax rate. I'm looking for us to be fair and equitable um, since our businesses have been good to residential over the years is, is what I'm looking at. So, you know, I appreciate your presentation, Dan. Uh, Kishore, you had something? Yeah, so, um... Kishore Parmar. So I'm lucky enough to have, uh, my family's lucky enough to live in this town for 30 years and have multiple businesses in this town and have grown in this town. Um, my concern is I know commercial values are, have taken a large hit. Um, we're, we're particularly in the hospitality industry. Um, the occupancy dollars that we normally collect for the town has taken a huge hit. Um, and as you know, values decrease right now currently, and then they start to stabilize and go up, um, getting hit by a large um, or larger tax rate on the commercial side is gonna be very difficult for us to um, take. One of the reasons that my family has been able to grow our business in Hadley and then outside is because of the low tax rate in the single tax rate. Um, we have businesses in other communities, Springfield, high commercial tax rate. It's very difficult to operate there at times where, you know, to reinvest into the property. Um, outside of the big boxes, there are still a lot of mom and pop businesses on along Route 9 um, that are, they have, I have concerns about. Um, the economy seems to be stabilizing, but there's still a lot of unknowns out there. Um, development is still hard. Commercial lending is still very hard to get. Um, I just want this all to be known. Um, and things do trickle down eventually. Um, if you have a large corporate landlord, they will trickle it down to their tenants who will eventually have to pay or front that bill. Um, we're already seeing a couple of our tenants um, try to buy their own properties now because um, commercial properties are low right now and they've saved enough money. Um, I just want that to be noted and just want to put my two cents out there, what we feel like. Thank you. I appreciate that as a business owner that you have shared that with us. I appreciate that. Okay, who's uh, anybody else here for public, uh, the hearing to make comments, ask questions, now's your chance. Yeah. What does uh, Proposition 2.5 on a 2% on look like, Dan, on a single rate? Uh, the, the levy that we have this year is what the board voted on 
back in the spring that for this year they they voted to go up 508 which was the 301 for the growth plus part of last year which was approximately 205,000 of what you took off last year which was 499 and we're we're under about 249 thousand dollars still or i'm sorry 293,000 we're still under the levy this year the the figure that we that you guys agreed upon i believe <clears throat> was 08 which included $100,000 worth of growth of new growth and that figure came in at 136 so we just added the 36 to that because it's an offset of a wash the new construction picks that up so it doesn't impact anybody's taxes except the people that built the, the two and a half would be, we would go up the three, 301, which would amount to about 30 cents on the tax rate, maybe a little under 30 cents. And what, so that's two and a half for the uh, prop. And what's 2% at, you say? Uh, an additional 2% that, that the select board voted back during the budget hearings to increase, to re to recapture part of the 500,000 that you reduced taxes last year. Okay. Right. Anybody else for uh, questions or comments on the tax? Uh, Jane. And last, last fall, we reduced taxes because of COVID. If we hadn't done that, what would the tax rates look like? or the increases look like? If you had raised to the full levy last year, the residential increase this year would have been 275 instead of 410. I mean, the bill would still be 4610. So it's just, you got to break last year, but you recaptured part of that, that this year. Actually, if we had raised to the full last year and the full this year, the increase would have been 512. Thank you. So the 293 that we were not raising is an additional $102 on the residential side. And what percentage, what percentage is that 102? Roughly. Uh, the 102 or the 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 200 that 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 you guys voted to recoup the the 200 is roughly 20 cents on the tax rate so it amounts to about about $74 on the average house okay Linda, do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, yeah I, we've been following this for a few months as Dan's been working on it. It's been uh, very eye-opening to see something that we've all rejected for year after year after year, as Dan says, 30-something years. And um, I was on finance committee first in there in the early 80s and and um and again more recently and, and have sort of been accepted that we are a single tax rate community however this is an unusual year everyone knows it's an unusual year i don't think it's the intention i know it's not the intention of the assessors and it certainly wouldn't be if the select board or finance committee um go to support this that this is going to be a permanent change in the way hadley is how uh, the balance is between our our residents and our businesses I think there's a great appreciation for our businesses and, and the way that we have been operating. The difference this year is the um, is the balance has shifted right right bef right before us. As Dan says, we've got the valuation of these businesses went down, and yet some of them are selling at much higher rates than than what we are taxing them at. Um, I think for this one year that this makes sense for both the businesses. And there will be exceptions, but for both the businesses and the residents, I think our goal should be to try and keep the tax rate for their bills. I'm not talking that the, it's about the bills ultimately, not the rate. It's about the bills. Um, that the more we can keep people's bills, even from year to year, the the better it, the better it goes. We get to it's predictable. 
Um, it's steady. It's a sure, it's a sure thing. You know where you're going. I know um, for comparison, when we were building our buildings and uh, it went before the select board as to how do we want to manage this payment of all this debt. And we had a few different options presented about how we could pay off the debt and the select board without any question went for the uh, for the level funding that the level impact on the tax bills from year to year. And it's just much easier for people not to see an increase and a decrease and it, it go like this as we borrow and we spend on the on the uh, on the buildings and uh, have it just roll up and down like that. So we set up a, a steady amount that's going to be paid every year and we fit our plans into that process. And it's helped. Uh, I think it's helped a lot with the bills. So I see this as a similar situation where we have if we do nothing in this case, if we continue the way we've been doing it residents are going to see that spike this year and then it's going to come down again the following year and in many of the commercial businesses they are going to they're not going to see that increase this year they may see a decrease this year and then an increase the next year um and as dan said it's a it's not a matter of raising their taxes it's a matter of really should they be going down like that as we go up i think that if we have a plan and uh, it sounds like um, from what the assessors are, are the, the work that they've done and the charts that they put together, that keeping both the residents and the businesses taxes even by a split rate, and I don't know at which rate, I think that merits some further looking into over the next couple of weeks before you decide, um, where is that balance that you strike that you have the lesser, uh, you lessen the impact on the residents and 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 lessen the damage on the dis there must be a place there in the middle that that is going to look right or or maybe we we do want the full 10 percent. i haven't looked into it that much but i do favor going um for the split rate for this year and i think next year's a whole new discussion i think we really are coming up with a one-year plan covid has hit in so many ways had us saying well just this once oh this is unique just these special circumstances but it's true and here we are seeing here yet again another just this one time impact of the pandemic on our community on our on our residents on our businesses and if we can alleviate that by this by this tool that we have to level the tax bills level or at least keep a step if they're going to grow but they'll it'll be a steady growth and not this kind of down up growth if we have that tool to use and can um help keep things steady i i i, I hope that we would consider that and um and do that um uh, dan uh, maybe the assessors haven't discussed this yet but if we were to adopt a split rate and I, I you know, maybe it's different for, for each shift, but um, what do you see as the path forward back to a single rate over the next, I don't know, two or three years? Um, you know, looking at projected growth, uh, projected valuations, what would uh, I guess be your recommendation or how do you see us getting back to that single rate? The assessors look at, at the split rate recommendation for 22 as a one-year recommendation. I, I personally think that values on the commercial side are going to be back almost fully for next year. A lot of the smaller commercial is going to be up a lot for 23. The, the hospitality industry is going to take a little longer to come back. I mean, right now, last year, our motel excise was about half, a little less than half of what we took in the prior fiscal year. Our first quarter this year is probably two thirds to 75% of what we took in for fiscal 20 from what the state reported. So I think it's gonna take a couple of years before the hotel is back, but I think the other values are gonna climb enough where we're not gonna have to split the rate or it would be off slightly than where it was for fiscal 20, the percentages, but I don't think it's gonna be gonna be that far off where we would have to do this more than one year. Okay, so you're saying a one year, uh, a one year decision, and then, you know, let's say that 
based on what you're seeing, we go back to a single rate next year. Is that going to, are we going to be facing another huge jump for residential property bills or will the increased value in commercial buildings offset some of that? Residential is going to go up next year, but commercial is going to go up what it went down plus probably more for fiscal 23. I mean, I'm, we're still a couple months ahead of what's going to happen during that, that valuation period. But I, th I think that we're going to be looking at, at commercial values coming back a lot from where they were. That it's mostly the big boxes. I mean, you look at the, the big taxpayers in town got a sizable chunk taken off of their, or are going to have a sizable chunk when the, the bills come out in December, whether or not you split the rate or, or have a single rate. Okay. Any other um, comments or questions? Kishar, you had some else? No, um, Dan, I just want to say, I just appreciate you for <laughs> recognizing the hospitality industry and how it is going to be lagging um, compared to the other industries. Um, you know, that's what my family mostly represents. And I will tell you the beginning of 2020 and also the beginning of this year was horrible for us, um, tremendously horrible. Um, the fear, you know, things have gotten much better, but I will tell you in the hotel industry, there's always a constant fear in the hospitality industry, restaurants who constant fear of, um, a, a shutdown or a partial shutdown of what we had before and increased restrictions, just lingering. Yeah, I, I'd just like to say that everything that I said during this presentation kind of relies on us not having a, a fallback due to COVID. That everything continues to roll on as it's been rolling on for the last six months or so. And that values keep climbing. And we don't have restaurant shutdowns and bar shutdowns and movie theater shutdowns or gyms or hotel doesn't start to lag back. Because that, that's a big chunk of our revenue in town, tax-wise and local receipts meals taxes, motel taxes, everything. So hopefully we're, we're past the worst of it. But we can't predict what's gonna happen next year at this point. We'll know a little bit better in the spring. All right, last, uh, I guess we're getting down to the last call here for questions and comments for about the tax tax rate. I'll make a motion to continue this um, discussion and our vote until the our next meeting in two weeks when the finance committee has had a chance to uh, evaluate and um, uh, chime in on, on their recommendations also. This was the public hearing though, right? Like we don't need another one? I'm doing a continuation, Amy. Just continue the whole thing, public hearing also. Somebody else got something else to say about it. Really want to hear from them. any small businesses or big businesses or any residents. It's a continuation. All second. Okay, you got a motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on continuing or in uh, voting next meeting? Uh, was that yes? The roll call vote. Yep. Jennifer, will you go? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dan. And um, now it's the uh, Finance Committee's turn to work on this for, uh, for, for next uh, meeting. And we'll wait to hear the recommendations and we'll. Uh, Obviously, we're on the 17th if anybody has more comments. All right. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Um, let's jump up to 3.1, the consent agenda. I have warrants AP2217, AP2217S, PR2209, 
class two auto dealers license, exotic auto, 10 to 12 Russell Street. I'm gonna pull that out because Jennifer has something to say about that. Uh, police department resignation, Thomas Shabbat. Um, police department part-time police officer appointment, Thomas Shabbat. I'm gonna pull that out as well. So that way the chief can speak on that. We have the North Hadley Cemetery IFB Award, Gravestone Services of New England. Russellville Cemetery IFB Award, Gravestone Services of New England. Edward Hopkins Educational Foundation Celebration of Lights, signage request for Town Hall Lawn. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by John. And anything on that? Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Changalo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. All right, and Jennifer, do you wanna speak about the um, class two auto dealers license? Um, yes, so um, Paul is opening up Exotic Auto. They're moving down from where they were near on the corner of East Street and Russell to the corner of, is it Cemetery and Russell? Is that yes. right? Okay, um, they're moving down, oh, they, what is it, Cross Path? Cross Path, I believe. Okay, um, that one where everybody cuts out and makes the line longer. Um, yeah. So they're moving there. Uh, planning board has approved them for 15 vehicles on the property. Um, looking at sort of what the past is, knowing that they're business, I'm recommending that y'all put um, a, a, a limit of five vehicles for sale on the property. Um, I did speak to planning board and the building inspector's office about this. Um, they all thought that was a good number because he is going to sell vehicles, but he's also a major repair shop. That gives him plenty of both. Sounds like a plan. So moved. What are what do you have existing on the other property? Hold on, Too give many. Me give me a second. Amy. Yeah. Give me a second. 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 <laughs> I'm here in a second. Finally. <laughs> All right. Motion by Joyce. Second by Amy. John, what was the question? Uh, what were the numbers on the property that he was on before? He did not have a class two license on that property. He was a repair shop only. This is actually something new for him on his Russell Street location. Okay. Okay. And I see um, Bill Dwyer's here. Bill, do you have anything from the planning board to chime in on this? The uh, planning board approved a total of 15 vehicles for the site. We didn't allocate between vehicles for sale, vehicles being repaired, and employee vehicles. But uh, we thought 15 was about all that that site could support, especially given its uh, location at the uh, gateway to the town. And that 15 includes employee vehicles, repair vehicles, and vehicles for sale on the- yeah, Not to exceed 15 vehicles on site okay. at any time. Okay. Anything else on that? Just a question. Uh, is that vehicles outside or vehicles who are also inside? Visible vehicles or total vehicles? Bill? Yeah. Yeah. We didn't, um, I, I, I think we did anticipate uh, that he might be able to have two vehicles inside. It's only a two bay garage, as I recall. So it, it doesn't make a big difference, but they would be, uh, it'd have to be you know, 15 display vehicles. There are 15 parking spaces laid out on the plan. I even I even think 15 is a lot to tell you the truth that's not a very big lot down there and if I think he was overcrowded even on East Street I mean I'm not trying to be controversial here but I think he had an over amount of vehicles um, just a small piece of partial he had on East Street and Route 9 and now we're on this other piece. I'm not sure about putting 15 cars there to tell you the truth. Did the building inspector chime in on this one? That was planning boards, I believe. Just, just a planning board. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about 15. And I'm also concerned about 
uh, we are, already have an issue of people crossing over and going down Cross Path Road, cutting off from Route 9 going over there, and then people turning off of Route 9 going into this business. So I'm wondering how we're going to monitor this and how that was set up with the planning board. Well, one of the things I think we ought to look at is the fact that this is an auto business and therefore it's going to have cars on site. It's not I know, like, but, but 15 is a lot of cars. You have to look at the total amount of uh, space there on that property, whether you agree with 15 or not. That's still a lot of cars for that small partial of land, but that was the planning board's doing. I'm just looking to see how that's actually going to work out. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot share the um, site plan uh, from this computer. Um, if you give me a second, I'll jump on my other com uh, computer that I have my planning board files on, and I'll show you how the uh, plan was laid out. But we did not um, get into enforcement issues. The uh, intersection is marked, no left turn uh, going eastbound. Yeah. Um, and I understand it's marked according to the highway marking standards, which obviously don't uh, give you a chance to take a picture of a car turning left in front of a no left turn sign. But give me a second, I'll pull up the plan. Thank you, Bill. And Joyce, we can put you in charge. You can talk to the state if you'd like. Bill, does th is this what you're looking for? Uh, yes, correct. That is... Um, that is the plan, the site plan that was prepared, showing the, how the 15 cars will be laid out. And that's on board docs for anybody who would like to see it. Okay. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 20. Oh yeah, okay. When we had previously approved uh, Jeremy Ober on that site, um, there were actually uh, 20 cars. Um, and I believe Allowed. that was a situation that, that was quite a few years ago. And that was the situation where I think he might have gotten his um, license uh, from the select board first. And he just went in and asked for 20. And uh, it had a double rank of cars where there is now a single rank with two extras. Uh, I think that's how they got it up to 20, but um, it's, it, it is a larger site than it appears. Okay. Uh, and it's certainly a larger site than uh, where that previously occupied by exotic. Okay. Thank you, Bill. All right. If there anything else on that. Yeah, I guess Mike um, Spankenable had said he agrees with the 15 because it allows him for turn onto cross path road. So I, I guess I can go along with that for safety reasons. Thank you. Jennifer, roll call. Roll call vote Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chuggaloo. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. Parsons. There was Hello. a yes. You're muted. Amy. Hi, Hi. yes. Thank you. All right, and then uh, Chief, do you want to talk about Officer Chabot? Uh, yes, uh, really quickly. Um, Tom, as many of you know, is uh, my night shift sergeant. Uh, Tom is uh, leaving the profession. Um, he uh, wants to devote a little bit more time to his family and he has some personal reasons uh, that he wants to step away. Um, we, Tom and I had, uh, you know, a couple of really good meetings, and uh, one of the things that we're facing right now is uh, the board is well aware of um, with the future of policing and staffing and things like that. We are likely going to get one, if not two, more resignations uh, for officers who are leaving uh, to go to a department for more money. Um, uh, so uh, we, we're, we're kind of uh, entering a, a place where we're going to have a staffing shortage and we need to kind of make some moves to, um, to fill those gaps. And so Tom was, uh, Tom 
decided that he uh, would like to come back as a part-time officer. We need him, are going to need him very much. Uh, hopefully he'll be able to give us some time to get us through this stretch that we're about to go through, but I'm gonna recommend to the board that they accept his resignation. Uh, and then I'm going to recommend that you also uh, reappoint him as a part-time officer. And my hope is, is that we will only get one more resignation, um, but uh, it's a potential for two more. Uh, we will wait and see what happens there. As a uh, part-time officer, is he still going to be a sergeant or? No. He is resigning his position fully and we're just gonna bring him back uh, to assist with uh, working shifts. He's also actually one of my grant writers uh, and he has uh, graciously agreed to continue working on grants for us to get, you know, Hadley some free money. No, well, I'll make a motion to accept that. And um, given what we are um, experiencing here in COVID and people needing to take care of their families and things like that, this is a, not just a Hadley, problem. It's a nationwide problem of people uh, changing their jobs, changing their vocations, and doing things that they need to do for their families. And, um, you know, I think we're just on the tip of the iceberg here of what's going to, you know, is happening. And I, I thank Tom for uh, volunteering or asking to come back and do some shifts for us and things of that nature. And, you know, I, I certainly agree. I thank him for his service as a sergeant and uh, he's been an asset to our, our department. So uh, let's move forward and uh, at least accept his offer to do our grant writing and any other thing that he can help us with. So thank him. I'll second that. Okay, so motion by Joyce, second by Amy, and that's for both the resignation and the appointment as a part-time officer. Any other discussions on this? Jennifer, roll call. Real call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Changelo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to uh, public comments, uh, 4.1 on the list here. Uh, we'll limit this to 15 minutes and please limit your comments to three minutes or less so everyone has a chance to talk. Anybody here for public comments, turn on your camera and wave at us. Okay, last call. Uh, Tony Lynn. Yeah, Tony, hi. Go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to speak about the lighting issue that's going to be coming up tonight. Um, I am uh, Tony Lynn Morelli, 127 Rocky Hill Road. I am a wildlife ecologist. I have a PhD in ecology and evolution from Stony Brook University in New York. I was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley and I'm now a research ecologist and adjunct faculty at UMass. Um, artificial lighting has been, I'm just hoping, I'm gonna just speak really quickly about um, how I hope that we think about doing the LED lighting if we do it smartly. I think there's ways in which we can um, increase our safety, but also just think about the impacts of what on wildlife. Um, artificial lighting has been increasingly identified as a negative impact for the behavior and survival of animals and plants. Lights disorient migrating, migrating birds, disturb the behavior of bats and owls, and even increase disease transmission in birds. Some of the worst impacts are on insects. I know some people don't care, but we know as a farm um, town that um, insects are really important for pollination and as part of the uh, ecosystem. And it, we think that lighting might be one of the primary causes we've lost um, a approximately 75% of insects in the past 50 years. Um, there's impacts on trees and other plants as well. Um, and there's some recent studies showed that um, in fact, on a soybean farm that light from adjacent roads and passing cars can um, affect yield on crops. So there's big impacts. There's also impacts to human health, particularly exposure to blue light, which is often what LEDs um, that kind of light that LEDs are, are um, outdoor lighting for LEDs is used. So just to hopefully be thoughtful about it um, and the lighting we put in that we can do this right and to consider so we can minimize uh, negative impacts. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Jack, I saw you next. 
Yep. Thanks, David. And Tony, thanks for your comments. Let me follow uh, this up. I, um, I'm speaking in support of the LED lights, but I think we have to do it wisely. I was on the building committee for the new Hadley Public Library, and that library is filled with LED lights. But as the building committee was working, we made a point of choosing lights that were a little warmer on the color spectrum, just to make it easier for people reading and using those. So I do think that LED lights can work. We just need to do that smartly. Um, and what colors we choose, and also installing light shields when appropriate, so they don't sort of blast into people's houses. Uh, a question has come up in conversation with others. We know that some private citizens uh, for many years have been paying for street lights near their houses. And I don't know if Linda would have the answer to this, but if we can find out how many of the street lights are being paid for, the electric bills are being paid for by private citizens, and would those street lights be changed over by Eversource as well? Um, I am an advocate for this. I know it'll reduce our energy load, and I think that's a wise way to go. Um, and I just think we have to do this smartly. Thank you. Uh, Jack, real quick on that. Um, we have a 127 lights uh, that the town currently pays for. And uh, the reason that we're possibly taking this opportunity is because of a subsidy from Eversource by, of about 50-ish thousand dollars uh, to pay for the conversion process. Um, they won't pay to convert any of the non-municipal lights at this time. Mm -hmm. So um, something- Does any meeting know about how many non-municipal lights are in our town? I would have to ask Eversource, but those are billed directly to the homeowners, I believe. So it, it, I don't even know if I could get that information from them, but I can ask the question. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, Michelle. I'm also very much in support of LED lights for um, reducing carbon imprint, but I have the concerns that both Jack and Tony Lynn mentioned. I would really like to somehow make sure that both Eversource and the Hadley people who are negotiating the deal with Eversource on the new lights really, really go through the literature besides impacts environmentally and on the night sky. Um, Overly bright lights that aren't directed correctly can also pose a safety issue. As people get older, their eyes can't adjust from bright light to dark as easily, and air on the road is a potential issue. So again, there's a lot been written about this. I do know people from nearby towns who have had lights installed because they got a good deal from the utility, which ended up being too bright, too blue, not directed downward, directed upwards. And a friend of mine in a neighboring town has had difficulty sleeping since the new lights were installed. Um, you know, and she had to go to blackout shades, but you can't do it for the whole house. Um, so I really, I, I don't know how to ensure that these issues get discussed or, um, and it was another thought that whenever we undertake any kind of, um, infrastructure thing that we take environmental impacts into consideration in making our choices. Okay. Thank That's you. it. Anybody else for public comment? Can we, can we ask uh, Eversource about the shielding and uh, also the colors like you're talking about? Because we have, we have one we have installed. Did they, do you know if they put shields on that one? So, uh, Eversource is not Eversource is not really involved in that portion of the project. We have Paul uh, from Realterm that we're going to speak to uh, in just a few minutes, and he can speak to all those those options as far as uh, you know choosing the right lights and and whatnot. That this is what his company does, um, I believe, nationwide. So we'll we'll let him uh, speak to that. Um, Eversource. And I forgot to say something. Go ahead. Um, um, I wrote a letter, an email to all the members of the select board. I don't know if you received it. It has links to articles 
in the Gazette about these issues. There's also a local expert that you can consult with, James Lowenthal, who's an astronomy professor who's written extensively about this and um, knows, I believe, the ideal lumens and the ideal part of the spectrum for the lights to be used. Okay. All right, last call for public comments. All right, uh, thank you. That wraps up public comments. And before we get into the LED topic, is the representative from Eversource here for the poll here? Uh, yes, that's me, David, here. Uh, Peter? Yep. Um, do you want to talk about what you're asking for and uh, as far as the poll goes? Yeah, um, at 135 East Street, I guess the town's looking to remove a tree there. They might have already removed the tree. I'm not even sure at this point. But uh, Eversource has support wires attached to that tree, so they're proposing to install a stub pole um, pretty much in the same exact location as the tree. And, uh, yeah, that's really it. It's meant to support the facilities that are already out there. Okay. Yeah, my understanding is the tree is still there. They're just waiting for okay. the the support wires to be taken down to cut the tree down. So, sure. Yep. So moved. Okay. Amy's getting in all kinds of seconds tonight. <laughs> uh, can I just uh, can I jump in real quick? Um, yes. The, the uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all of you that I, I am. Uh, Carolyn asked me to uh, assist with some of her duties while she's on vacation. So you're all in some serious trouble here. Um, but uh, one of the things that Jennifer and I did go over today is that um, the resident who uh, lives at that address just wanted to be clear and make sure that that pole uh, is going to go in at the farthest corner um, at, at the residence. And I think we were told that it was, but I just wanted to make sure that it was said on here and confirmed so that we don't... Um, have any issues there yes it, it will go in that corner there and i mean if the resident would like we can send someone up there to meet with them and we can stake out the exact location in the field that's that's great thank you and uh the only other question i have is i just want to make sure that there are no other abutters to the property um on the meeting that may wish to speak on this i guess you're good all right roll call jennifer Roll call vote Hill? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Peter, I'll turn this over to the town clerk tomorrow and she'll be in touch with the rest of it, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank right. you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye. All right, uh, 6.2 good energy update. We're gonna actually uh, skip that for tonight, put that off to a future meeting. They weren't quite ready for that. Good energy is the um, electrical aggregation for the town. Um, but we will move on to 6.3 real term energy. Paul is here from real term. And uh, Paul, do you wanna give us the, the Cliff Notes version of what we're trying to do? And um, we'll go from there. <laughs> Yes, hi everybody, and thank you, David. You know, before I do that, let, let me address some of the concerns that some of your constituents have, uh, which is something that uh, we're quite accustomed to and experienced with, and that is regarding issues like blue light exposure, um, light trespass, dark skies. So uh, we've done, completed 325 municipal LED conversions, 98% of them are in the, in the Northeast. Uh, been working in the Bay State for many, many years. I'm a resident of Florence, so I'm very, very familiar with Hadley and, uh, and, your, and your lighting. Um, we recently uh, received some accolades from a project that we've finished in Pepperell in the eastern part of Massachusetts by a gentleman who is the director of the Astrophysics Observatory at MIT. And I'll share this with you later, I'll send an email to you, but he said that this was, in his mind, quote, the best uh, lighting efficiency project that he's ever seen. Uh, this gentleman sits on the Dark Sky Consortium, um, 
We went through an exhaustive pilot uh, with Pepperell because they had a lot of concerns uh, like you do on um, uh, Kelvin color temperature. And they opted for you know, one of the lowest uh, Kelvin color temperatures uh, that has been deployed, which is 2200. Um, for those of you who are not lighting experts, um, the, you know, the sort of um, brightness of the LED lights um, varies from 4,000 or five, what it used to be 5,000, which is sort of the whitest, brightest light, down to uh, 2,200 now, which is about the lowest that's deployed for luminaires, which is the closest uh, to high pressure sodium or the, you know, softer, yellower light that you're used to with, a, with, a, with the lowest level of blue light exposure. So, um, uh, I, I'm, I hope, you know, people will feel comfortable with the experience that we have and the way we approach these projects. Um, we're here to give you the lighting that Hadley wants and needs. So we don't, we don't come in with any uh, predisposed preferences on color temperature. Um, we're going to have conversations with you and figure out what you want. Um, and we'll let you know what works. Uh, we won't sacrifice safety. Um, for color temperatures. So we'll design photometrically uh, the proper lighting uh, based on the Kelvin color temperature that you select. Um, it could be 2200, it could be 2700. We'll, we'll have those discussions with you. Um, also in terms of making Hadley brighter, um, again, the objective of this, of this project <clears throat> is to upgrade and convert your existing lighting to LED. Um, you're going to be taking ownership over the uh, current Eversource owned street lights, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll own those lights going forward. So we're looking to optimize your lighting uh, with your existing infrastructure. We're not, we're, we're not gonna brighten up Hadley um, unless between us, we identify a, an area where safety is an issue and you don't have proper lighting and you need lighting for uh, for either vehicles and or pedestrians to be able to move about safely. Otherwise, the project really is upgrading your existing infrastructure, street light infrastructure, taking ownership of that uh, and, and providing much more energy efficient lighting. Um, I'm going to show you very quickly, uh, if I may, the numbers on this project, if I if I can share my screen. You can, Paul, go ahead. I can do that, okay. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. So here's just a list of um, some of the projects that we've uh, we've done in New England. You know, close by you, we, we uh, completed West Springfield and Agawam recently. We've done Sunderland, Williamsburg, Pittsfield probably, you know, most of the Western Massachusetts uh, lighting project we've, we've managed over the years. So we took, we took your inventory, which I assume you got from Eversource, and we ran our analysis uh, showing uh, that the cost of the project was just south of $50,000. Um, Eversource with this new program, and we've never seen anything like this before where a utility uh, unilaterally offers to pay the full price of an LED conversion. So it's, it's really quite, quite an opportunity. Um, the incentive, therefore, if they do pay 100%, will be the full 49,540. Your only cost will be to acquire that infrastructure, and that's uh, at 15,870. The project payback is less than a year. It's 0.9 uh, years. Um, the option two there, and most of the projects that we've done in Massachusetts and elsewhere have incorporated smart controls. Very briefly, what smart controls allow you to do is to um, identify failures and outages um, without having to visually inspect them. So today, the only way you know if a light is out in Hadley is for somebody to drive down Route 9 or in your side streets and see if the light is out. With smart controls, uh, they send a signal to a central management system and we know uh, when a light is out and when it's failing. So our service levels go up complaints go down, safety goes up. It also allows you to dim and trim those lights. So uh, one application is uh, 
uh, for example, on route, route nine or other areas where you have you may have more nocturnal activity, uh, you can uh, intensify those lights during closing time and then uh, and then slowly dim them out as the as the night uh, goes on. Uh, Massachusetts now, since last year, and this is one of the few states in the U.S. where you can not only save energy but save money. So the uh, Public Service Commission now has mandated that every source and national grid uh, meter uh, any of the lights where you do have smart control. So you, you can actually save money as well as energy there. Um, and then very, very quickly, um, we were recognized by the World Bank uh, a year uh, and a half ago for our methodology of best practices for doing street light projects. So we're, uh, we start with a pole by pole uh, GIS inventory. We're collecting about 17 different data points. You're gonna own this infrastructure. So you wanna know exactly what it is that you own. Uh, and you'll, you'll have an updated asset management database, which will include the, um, uh, the situation and uh, status of, of the wiring, of the pole, of the mast arms, every, everything that has to do with these streetlights. From there, then, we, we um, put out competitive bids, both for the labor and the materials, uh, according to Massachusetts procurement laws, uh, and we'll select the optimum equipment and, uh, and contractor uh, for your job. You, you, you have... Um, <clears throat> Uh, you have a say and you have veto power every, everywhere through this project from beginning to the end. So, you know, you're, you're hiring us because we, we know a lot about lighting and we've done a lot of these projects, but if for whatever reason you disagree with the decisions that we make regarding contracting, regarding uh, technology or equipment, uh, you, have, you have final say. We'll explain to you our methodology, how we weigh the different criteria for selection of luminaires, uh, looking at life cycle costs um, and savings and photometrics. Um, uh, but again, if for whatever reason you wanna change that selection, uh, the decision, the final decision is yours. We also uh, weave in and uh, this, everything is included that I'm talking about in these numbers of uh, third party quality control. So we'll have both our field in installation supervisor and then a, an independent third party going behind uh, looking at a randomly selected a number of fixtures at different wattage levels to make sure that they're properly properly deployed, um, both uh, in terms of manufacturers and ever sources specifications. So the quality control is a, is a big part of, uh, of what we do. And then lastly, <clears throat> a big question if it hasn't come up, uh, uh, usually comes up in our conversations with municipalities that have acquired their uh, infrastructure, what about maintenance? Uh, how do we handle that? So we provide maintenance to many of our clients uh, and we'll, uh, we'll offer that to you. You don't have to contract us uh, for that. Uh, but if you don't, uh, we'll put together a maintenance program for you and we'll help you select uh, another contractor to do that maintenance work for you. What we do know now with uh, over 350,000 uh, lights out there over the last eight years, uh, is that the failure rate on these LED fixtures is way below what you're experiencing now with high pressure sodium, approximately 0.3 or 0.4% per annum. So you know, very, very, very little you can expect in, uh, in, in the way of having to replace the, uh, these lights. So um, I don't want to take too much more of your time. I just wanted to give you a, a bit of a taste and an, an overview about who we are and uh, how we go about doing this work uh, and paying particular attention to your constituents' concerns uh, regarding dark skies and uh, Kelvin color temperature and blue light exposure. All right, thanks, Paul. And I do have an update, Eversource. Uh, we did sign the letter of intent that you gave me um, authorization to sign a couple meetings ago. And they came back and they, they said, according to their records, they have, we have 127 light fixtures and the cost to acquire them is right around $9,600. So the payback should be um, a little bit less than, uh, than what we had uh, anticipated. I think uh, initially it was something like seven months, but I guess it should be a little bit less than that based on that number. Um, so the next step is uh, what I'm asking for tonight is um, authorization to sign the service agreement with real terms so that way they can get started on their GIS um, data collection. 
and start mapping all the streetlights in town and verify that we actually have streetlights where every source says we do. I have a question first. Um, actually, I have a couple of questions. So once we own this system, we're buying it back from Eversource, is the town then responsible for pole maintenance? When a car hits a pole and knocks it down, is that ours? Yeah, so there, there are two aspects of maintenance two aspects of maintenance when it comes to the streetlights. They're the, uh, the luminaires and the mass storm. So when, you, when you're buying your infrastructure from Eversource, you, you're actually taking ownership of that mass storm out to the fixture. With regard to poles, to pole knockdowns, um, you'll have to take out additional insurance uh, on, on those assets, on that infrastructure. Uh, we can get some numbers for you that we've gotten from uh, Athol and uh, Sunderland and Williamsburg and some of your neighbors uh, in terms of what those costs are, but I can tell you they're minimal. It's really a, a small amount of, uh, of annual cost for insurance to cover those uh, pull, eventual pole knockdowns. Okay. Um, I also want to know if there's any way that private citizens who owns the, own these lights that we've been talking about can contact you and buy in paying independently to be part of this project so that all the town matches if they want to go the cost. Is that a possibility? So again, certainly, and um, you know, we can talk about this later on if you, if you want us, when we go and do our GIS inventory, and, and David, thanks for sharing with me the, the updated inventory. We're going to we're going to do a pole by pole um, physical inventory of your of your streetlights. So that the number that, that you just communicated, it may or may not be accurate. We'll let you know with 100 percent certainty what the what what that number looks like. And if you'd like us to consider other lights uh, which are not owned by Eversource uh, in the project, we'd be happy to audit those uh, while we're out there. Okay, um, and then if we. Do, do all the towns that have worked with you have a maintenance contract or do some of them try to do it on their own? Some of them do it on their own. Uh, not everybody contracts our maintenance services. Uh, typically it's, it's a function of what resources they have. You know, if they, um, some of the larger towns and their cities have bucket trucks and they have electricians. So they're, you know, they've got the capability to uh, undertake their own maintenance. Most do not, um, even cities and towns, which are several times larger than Hadley, typically they, they, they just don't have the resources in public works to, um, uh, to undertake maintenance. So again, we can offer for you, and if for, for whatever reason you don't wanna contract our maintenance services, we'll put together the maintenance uh, service agreements for you and service levels and, and help you uh, select a, a maintenance contract. Thank you. Okay, so any if there's not any other questions, I just need a motion to uh, David. David. Okay. Yes. So, David, is this totally taking us away from Eversource altogether? Uh, as far as town lights go, yes. Okay. Well, they're still supplying the energy. We're just <clears throat> owning the equipment, they are. right? Right. They are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so they'll continue to supply the energy. Uh, what will happen is you, your your tariff uh, will switch from a, a utility-owned tariff to a municipal-owned tariff, and, and therein lies a lot of your savings. So you've got two two places where your savings is coming from. One is taking ownership of the streetlights, and then the second is reducing your uh, your wattage right because leds are much more energy efficient than your current high pressure sodium the other driver and this is the reason why not just in massachusetts but in uh, throughout the northeast where legislation is in place for municipalities to take ownership of their street lights this is a strategic asset uh, you know today it's just street lights uh, but tomorrow uh, it could be small cell densification it could be public wi-fi it could be electronic vehicle charging modules all of these services are now fully integratable within the streetlight uh, asset. So, you know, this is a forward thinking um, action that, that you're taking. Uh, that, that streetlight network is really gonna be a delivery network for a lot of services, which you may not be ready for today, but a year or two down the road, you, you'll be happy that you're, you have control of, of this destiny. All right, I, I, I guess that's where I'm confused right now because I'm thinking, 
um, auto accident. We have several around town. If somebody takes out a telephone pole, the lights on it, cables on it, everything's on it. Who replaces the pole? That that ever source does. So again, um, what what your what Hadley will be on the hook for in terms of maintenance costs will be the asset that you own, which is the the, the mass dorm and the, and the street light. So if there's a pole knocked down, okay. You're, you're gonna cover the cost of that potential maintenance on your, your part of the asset uh, through your insurance. Eversource will, as they are today, be responsible for replacing that pole. Okay. I think the, tel the telephone company owns some poles and Eversource owns some poles. It depends on the pole and the number and that. And they all like to argue and say the other one owns it. You ask them a question about it. Yeah, that's my problem. Who's going to actually be responsible for it was my, my bottom line question when you come down to this. You know what the state plans were for uh, the next phase of Route 9 project with streetlights? I didn't happen to see any of that on the plans. So the streetlight listing that I have from Eversource doesn't show that the town pays for any of those lights that are on Route 9, other than um, I think there might be one or two at intersections, but any of the other streetlights uh, on Route 9 are, I'm guessing, are paid for by Mass DOT. Right. That is true. Right. That's, yeah, that's true. true. That's true. Uh, Sue had a question. Sue? Yeah, um, I can get a quote from Maya to find out what their cost for this is. Um, if this has been done in other towns, clearly they should have um, some rate structure. So just want to throw that in there. Yeah. A question for Paul. Um, some of the polls are owned by uh, Eversource and some by the telephone company. Will your survey of polls show us whose is whose? Yes, yes. Well, um, again, again, you know, based on the inventory that that we have, we'll uh, we'll audit uh, each and every one of those polls and and then um, uh, confer both with you. Is this Verizon? Is Verizon on some of those polls? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've. We've had several projects before in uh, in Western Mass with uh, with multiple pole ownership, so we'll we'll address that. Thank you. So, do we have a motion? If not, I'll make one. All you I make a motion that we go forward with this. All right. Uh, could you give me authorization to sign the document? I will give you author. I move we give. David, authorization to sign the documents to go forward with this project. Second. Yay, Amy. <laughs> motion, motion by Jane, second by Amy. She's doing a lot of work tonight. Yeah. Uh, any other discussion on this? All right, Jennifer. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungaloo. Yes. Miskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. And I'll um, work on that tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Next up is uh, 7.1 Old Business Community Preservation Act Committee at Large Opening. And um, looks like we have four individuals that Jennifer you want to talk about this you were the one that took the uh, submissions in um, sure uh, we received uh, four letters from individuals who are interested in joining the committee all of their letters are attached uh, for y'all to review they've been up since Monday um, I do know that Mary Thayer is on board and she is the chair of the committee right now um, that that's that is all the information I have. Y'all have that one at large seat that is open right now due to Edwin resigning as an at large and taking a conservation position. Okay, so we just need a motion to appoint someone to that spot. 
I'm going to make a motion to appoint uh, Andy Morris Friedman to that spot. Um, there was a snafu in him applying for the position the last time, um, but he also has attended all of the meetings since then. <clears throat> and I feel like that um, he would, you know, be an asset to the committee. He has asked to be reappointed to the committee, and I will make that motion. I'll second. Okay, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on this? Jennifer? Roll call vote. Uh, Phil? No. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. Parsons? No. Thank you. That's a 3 2 vote. Okay. So Andy has that spot. And thanks to everybody that put in for that uh, one opening. That's a pretty good um, response, actually. So we have lots we... of other positions in town open. Yeah, there's a lot more positions open if they're interested. You're taking my announcement. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta throw it in there, Phil. <laughs> Well, you can I guess still I'll say, Chair Phil, what the positions are. Okay. I'll jump to that announcement then. So <laughs> right now we are seeking members for the Cemetery Committee, the Bylaw Review Committee, and the Mosquito Opt-Out Committee. Um, please submit those letters of interest to the select board at info at hadleyma.org by November 10th. And just to be clear, that they have to be into that email address nowhere else because otherwise they don't get seen or considered so if you submit them to the chairs of those committees or something along those lines they don't count they need to go to jennifer at that email so that way we see them and put them on the list thank you david i was going to reiterate that also that it does need to come to us and not to the committee itself okay. thank you Je uh, jane COVID testing at the senior center so starting next week um, asymptomatic COVID testing will be done on a walk-in basis at the senior center. Um, the times vary. So for information about what the current week's schedule will be, please call the senior center at 586-4023. Jane, is there any update that we might be doing any boosters or are those just going to be left to going to uh, our local pharmacies or whatever? We keep asking Northampton Health Department to use our facility to do booster shots. And they keep saying it's a nice place. We're not ready yet. OK. Good to know so people can get to know. Thank you. Yes. However, we're having a flu clinic tomorrow. Oh, today, Yay. I'm sorry. It's over. We did it. It's done. Oh. It was today. <laughs> I missed today. I was at the doctor's. What can I say? But still, everybody, if they have the opportunity, I'll, I'll put a plug in here um, to get your booster shots. They are, they are available at uh, pharmacies. You just have to go online to different pharmacies and see where you can get a booster. Um, you can mix and match. It is uh, part of the CDC that even if you did get a Mordi uh, Medina, M Moderna, that you can get a Pfizer. So whichever is available to you or vice versa, if you've got a Mordina, you can get a Pfizer. So um, I would suggest that you probably go online and see what's available to get your booster and um, your flu shots, please get them also. It's just as important as your COVID vaccinations. Um, people do die with flu, with flu as well they have died with COVID. So it is important to get vaccinated for both. Joyce, I believe if you got Johnson & Johnson, you could get either Moderna or Pfizer. Boosted. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That is that is right. I'm sorry, John, that is correct. All right, and then Joyce, do you wanna talk about trunk or treat? Trunk or treat. We kind of missed it last weekend with that bad weather. And uh, the police and fire have set up their trunk or treat for this Friday night. And it will be from five to seven. And uh, please uh, 
bring your kids out, dress them up again. I'm sure they certainly won't mind getting into their costumes again and coming out for the trunk or treat. Uh, we do want to uh, do Halloween and Hadley uh, this Friday night. So please come out and support our park and rec and people that have uh, volunteered to um, be there. Um, it's a good event, have fun. I'll be there with some sheep again. Yay, Amy. <laughs> I love your sheep. <laughs> And dress them up again too. Yeah. <laughs> My cousin had had sheep, but he and he and he went into the 4-H, and it wasn't 4-H, but he did show at the fairs. Um, they didn't dress them up back then. <laughs> it's cute. It's People cute. like it. <laughs> Very cute. Very cute. All right. Um, announcements. I do have a few this One. evening. One. Yeah, I was going to say, Joyce. Go ahead. Go, go Amy. No, I was going to say that we lost Beth Cook. I did not see that posted yet in the newspaper. So that was one thing I it, normally we don't do, but, you know, until it's, we've seen it. But oh. certainly go ahead, Beth, um, Amy. No, I was going to say that we lost Beth Cook of Flavor, Flavor of Cook Farm in Hadley. Yeah. I, I thought that was going to be one of yours. I'm well, be, oh, be, because we don't have anything written yet that we sometimes don't post them. But, you know, um, I've known Beth for years. Um, Beth grew up in Sunderland. Um, she was well known throughout our valley as Flavors Cooks and uh, raised a great family, um, certainly, um, in, in starting up flavors, um, that was her, that was her thing. And I'm so glad that her family has continued it for her. Um, mm -hmm. she had a crush on my cousin. I won't say who he was, but you know, he has passed also, but you know, Beth and I had a connection over the years and she was just a great, um, friendly, outgoing person and um certainly will be missed by our community and 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 yeah. flavors itself so yeah definitely Thanks. part of our church as well um the first yeah. church in hadley and was always there for um you know the church suppers and helping out and just a huge pillar yeah. of our community a big loss yeah it certainly is she was she was a wonderful person i agree with you amy thank you um I do have others. Um, uh, Julius Grundunisham, um, he lived here in Hadley, so we send our condolences to his family. Uh, Antoinette Rodak, um, send our condolences to her family. Frank Lestowski, uh, we send our condolences to his family. And John Miller, who has been um, uh, a lifelong citizen here of Hadley also. We send our condolences to him and his family. So I have a little bit more for our condolences this evening, but the select board does send them out to all of the families this evening. All right, any other announcements? Oh, could I, I just say one more? Yeah. Um, as part of my family here in Hadley and growing up in the community uh, and being a lifelong resident of um, the whole, whole area, my doctor at our orthopedic practice, uh, Dan McBride has passed away unexpectedly. Um, he saw many patients in our community. He had many people in the biking community and uh, just was a really gracious person in and outside of the hospital. Um, so my condolences to his family and all of his patients and people that he touched their lives with also. He was a, a really good person. So condolences to his family also. All right. Anything else? Uh, our next meeting, I believe, is the 17th. And so we'll continue the public hearing and we need to vote on the tax uh, 
split or single rate that evening. So yeah, can we took a take a look at December because the third Wednesday of the month I might not be here. Or it's the Legion dinner. Uh, what do we have scheduled in December uh, right now? Jack it would Dean. be the it would be the first and the fifteenth, which is the first and the third. And I do love a Legion dinner, but it's also license renewal time. <laughs> If, if I find somebody to deliver the Legion dinner to your home, can we stick with the 15th, please? Stick with the 15th. I, I mean, it's y'all's meeting, but for the license point of it, it would be helpful because all, all of your licenses are going to be coming in over the next, you know, 30 days. And you're going to be busy. Do you want to do uh, with the eighth work instead? for the licensing or do you need it spread out like that more toward the 15th i'd like it spread out more towards the 15th because that gives people a little bit more time instead of everybody automatically becoming late after the first okay and, and by the first i mean january 1st what if we went to the 22nd let's not do that because i don't want to work on the 22nd okay yeah sorry i want well, my cake and i want to eat it <laughs> yeah and i i can't promise that i might be there on the 15th but we'll see okay. uh, that's all i can say i only asked for a couple during the year and this was one of them um but we'll see how about the 29th is that uh a... that's 20... really tight Tw 29th is good for me i don't party new year's eve anymore i'm too old maybe we should have three i think that I think the 22nd would be better than the 29th. Not, I'm actually taking off the 22nd through the beginning of the first of the year. Okay. Um, I have vacation that I just I have to use. Okay. And well, well just sir. tell me when to show up and I'll be here. All right. <laughs> All right. We'll we just want, do we want to switch it to the 8th? And then I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to switch to the 8th if we could. All right. I know it's not quite as long, Jennifer, but as if yeah, I guess I mean we... some of them got to wait till after the first of the year. We've done it in the past anyway, the late ones. So okay, All right. that good with everybody. Uh, first and the eighth of December. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. All right. So we'll see you on the seventeenth. And if I could get a motion to adjourn, motion oh, to adjourn. Fine. Second. Oh. <laughs> right. by Joyce, second by Amy, and uh, thanks, Chief, for your uh, sitting in the town administrator chair. I guess over there, it's very exciting. I guess um, <laughs> super exciting. Anybody else got a job they want to give to me? I'll take it. I can give you a few, but we'll we'll do it together. Yeah, You're oozing with sarcasm <laughs> and excitement. We always have lunches right. to deliver. Glad everybody picked up on that. Uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Muscovitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you all. Good, Good night. Job, Chief. Okay. Happy. Bye. Oh, okay. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>